you will see exactly the slides that I'm sharing right now. Um, so if you want to consult them later, you have them already. Uh, so the goal of this uh, workshop, tutorial, uh, presentation, let's say today, is I want you to uh, know several things, but obviously you won't be knowing everything because it's a very uh, wide topic, but at least I want that you know that you, what, what, what should you know about what is the aspects that you need to think about for a project to be reproducible. So identify what must be managed for reproducibility and we will learn or I will talk about three tools that are really important. First of all is RENV, then is targets. So these are both R packages. And finally, there's Docker. So Docker is a bit, uh, so it's not directly related to R. It's a, it's a software tool that's been used for many, many applications, uh, but it offers a nice opportunity for reproducibility with R or with any, any software, really. It's, it's completely independent. Uh, what I will not be talking about, but that is still quite useful to know about if you really want to, you know, to cover all your bases, let's say, is functional programming concepts. Git and GitHub, obviously, very important, uh, and documenting and testing your code and packaging your code. So I won't be talking about that as well, um, but these are also very important topics. So the main reference for this workshop, as uh, Tabea said in the introduction, is uh, a book I, I published, self-published, I must say, uh, that I have right here. It looks like this, uh, it's quite thick. Um, and it focuses on all these aspects. Uh, there's a free version. So on the slides, you'll have this link there that you can click. Uh, you can read it for free online, uh, but if you prefer paper, you can also get it on Amazon. And there's also a DRM free pub and PDF. Um, so this was my, uh, yeah, there's the book, the link for Amazon. So this was my self-promotion. Now let's go straight to the core uh, of today's presentation. So what do I mean by reproducibility? I think this is important first to really, because there are several, uh, let me remove this, yeah. there are several maybe definitions that you can think of. And in the context of this workshop and, and of the book, uh, what I mean is that I really want to be able to recover exactly the same results from an analysis that I ran in the past. So I want exactly the same thing. Um, and the question is, why would we want that? Well, I guess uh, most of you, if not all of you, are researchers and scientists, so you probably know why that is important. But also outside of research, it's quite important because of auditing purposes, for example. Uh, also, whenever we have a report that we need to update, let's say, and we need to update that report maybe monthly or quarterly, uh, if, I, if I update my, my report, I want the uh, differences to only come from the data that is new, right, that is fresh. I don't want anything to interfere with that because if somehow my computational environment changed, well, then I'm not entirely sure if the differences are due to the data or they're due to this change in the computational environment or both. So that's that's one issue. Then of course, uh, reproducibility as a cornerstone of science, as you all know. Um, and I won't talk about it, but it's also quite interesting, and I mentioned that in the book, is uh, working on an immutable development environment. So what this means is that I want to set up uh, my computational environment in a way that it will never change. So I can, for example, update my operating system, I can update other programs, but my development environment will stay uh, the same. And this is quite interesting, and you can achieve that with Docker. Now, uh, the question that arises is, well, if I have the original script and if I have data, you know, what's the problem? Why, why do we need all of these things? Why do we need Docker? Why do we need R end? I have data, I have the script. Uh, I can reproduce the results without any issue, right? Well, not really. There are four main things that could influence the results of an analysis or rather um, the, the possibility of reproducing the results of an analysis. First of all, the version of R R or Python or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Uh, this is a workshop focused on R, but it could be anything else. Uh, the versions of packages that are used. Uh, so uh, these packages evolve and they, the results they produce could change. The operating system itself. And finally, the hardware. So the hardware, I won't be talking too much about it, uh, but it's also related to, uh, to the three first points in the sense that if hardware changes, the only, I mean, if hardware has an influence on your results, the only way to really be able to deal with that is to work with open source software, because you can 
keep recompiling that software for that particular hardware. But I won't be talking about this today. I will talk about the three first points and I will give you some examples. First of all, oh, well, and <clears throat> this, sorry, I didn't mention that, but these four points, they, if you, if you want, you can look at them through the lens of uh, a continuum. So you could say, well, reproducibility is on a continuum and the more you deal with, the more points you deal with it here, the better or the more reproducible your analysis is. So for example, this is a, a reference from uh, uh, Roger Bank from 2011 uh, about this idea of reproducibility being on a continuum. And basically his point is that, well, if you only have a paper, a research paper, that's not reproducible. If then you add code to it, that's better, that's more reproducible. If you add code and data, that's even better. If you add code data and what he calls linked and executable code, you, we could uh, say that this is the operating system for our purposes. If you add that, even better. And the more you go, you add stuff, the more the more you add uh, and you deal with these different points that I mentioned before, the closer you are to a full replication and to the gold standard. Um, so let me give you some uh, examples, and then I'll, I'll look at the questions. Here are what happens when R gets updated. So before R version 3.6. Uh, if you wanted to get uh, a sample of five integers, you could run that code and you would get the series two, six, five, eight, nine. And this was with a seed of one, two, three, four. After the release of R 3.6, there were some changes in how R computes uh, uh, pseudo uh, random numbers. And now we get something different. And this has a real impact on, uh, on, on papers that we've written with R before 3.6. And, and uh, as, as Tavia mentioned, I'm currently working uh, with, uh, with a colleague on, on such a paper where we are rep reproducing, or rather, we, we were trying to reproduce a paper and we didn't find the results because of that. And so our paper shifted now a little bit in focus. Now we are talking about this, uh, these problems and, and uh, explaining how we can deal with that. Um, then ver package versions, that's the second point I mentioned. Uh, here is an example with the package Stringer before uh, the, its version 1.5. If you ran the code uh, up here, right, if you ran this, you would get the character A as a result. Now, with the latest release of Stringer, if you try to run this, you get an error, which is actually the right behavior. Actually, the behavior before was not really correct. It was not really consistent with how a Stringer was supposed to be working. Uh, however, even though this update now corrects this problem, let's say if you relied on that, if you relied on that behavior in one of your older scripts, well, now you have a problem because uh, it's not going to run anymore. You, you, you will get an error if you try to run that particular script. And finally, I will talk about the operating system. And here I have a reference from a paper in chemistry where the authors tried to uh, reproduce results from a very influential study. Apparently, I, I don't know anything about chemistry, but apparently that was quite an important paper. And they didn't, they weren't able to find the results, even though they had the right version of Python. So this was a, an analysis uh, conducted with Python. They had Python, they had the data, they had the right version of packages as well. Everything was constant, but the difference came from the operating systems. And here you see the same analysis run on Linux, run on Windows, and or on two different versions of Mac OS, always produce different results. The only consistency is between Windows 10 and uh, Mac OS Mavericks. And um, why? Why, the, why did that happen? Well, it turns out that the original analysis relied on how the operating system sorted files on the computer. So, this, what I'm showing you here, is uh, are the files, the, 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 the data sets that are used as an input. And you see that on Windows up here, they are ordered in a certain way. And on Linux, they're ordered in another way. And um, the order mattered because the original authors used the order to uh, um, compute certain um, weights. Um, I don't know the details. But basically, if the order is different, then the results are different. And uh, yeah, so this was really a, a problem of how the operating system impacted the, uh, the results. Now, obviously, to deal with that, the, the solution is, in a sense, simple. You have to kind of hard code, hard code which weights 
go which which with which weights go with which files, but uh, at the time uh, the authors didn't know that. So we have all of this uh, that we have to deal with. So the problem is the uh, works on my machine. So that, that's the problem. You, you write something, you write some code, whatever it is. Is it a research paper? Is it a report? Is it whatever? It works on your machine, but it works nowhere else. Um, and so the solution is that we will ship the whole computer then with the paper. And now I will see if there are some questions already or some reactions before continuing. So I see uh, some things in the, uh, if you get different results when you change the seed, is that not useful information? Yeah, well, definitely. That was, uh, that's definitely where the research project is going. So uh, actually we, um, so we, we, when we replicate the results, what happens is indeed that we uh, get different results with different seeds, right? And actually this shows, as you mentioned, that there is probably an issue uh, with like the, 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 with the stability of the model. Probably the uh, you know, identification strategy that was used is not really valid. So that's definitely something that we kind of discovered when we tried to reproduce it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the point that it could be, be done, uh, you know, inten intentionally. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so as Manuel says, the, the, so indeed, the, the, the different result was computed by a different seed because we, the updated version of R. But, um, but Tom is right that it shouldn't have a really an impact, uh, theoretically. Uh, if, you, if, you, if your seed, I mean, your results should be relatively consistent. And here we have quite different, um, the results are quite different. And actually, I even, like we even computed a table where I loop over 100 different seeds and I always get something different. So that's really not a bad sign, actually. So the, this, this replication exercise, in a sense, is successful, uh, but it also highlighted this uh, problem with a newer version of R. So I can, I can talk about it in more detail uh, at the end. Uh, wait, this is my R studio. So yeah. Uh, so to illustrate all of this, I will walk you through a project. Um, and this is the, the same, it's the same project I use in the book to introduce these ideas. So in the book, I start with a very simple analysis uh, and I show how we can make it more and more robust or more and more reproducible. And I will do the same here without going into every, every detail. Um, but our project will focus on housing in Luxembourg and um, like many different countries, housing is extremely expensive uh, in Luxembourg and has, has been exploding these last years, and it's really a problem. And so what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you this data uh, that we are going to use. And this is a, a real data set from a real public administration in Luxembourg that shows uh, the number of, um, first of all, the number of, uh, of, um, I can't find, of advertisements, let's say, of houses. And then the prices, the average prices they were sold, okay, in different communes. So a commune is a, an administrative, administrative subdivision of Luxembourg, okay, uh, like a county in the US, something like that. And you see down below here, we have different sheets, one sheet for each year. So this is a real data set that you can download from the Open Data Portal, from the Luxembourg Open Data Portal, and that I will analyze. And... I will start with something very simple, okay? I will write two scripts, one script to get the data out of this Excel into a nice format for analysis, and then one script to actually do my analysis. So this is really a classic way of working, you know, uh, and we'll see what is maybe wrong with it or what, how we could do things better. So the, this R Studio you're seeing yeah, is actually running inside the Docker container. I'll explain that uh, later. So project start. So save data and analyze data. So save data. Um, Can I just quickly you know, inter interrupt oh, there? Yes. There's just one more question maybe before you start with Shari. Ah, yes. So, so what, if the what if the reason why we can reproduce a result, can't, I guess, reproduce a result is because we're using different hardware, so different CPU, Arch, GPU? Yeah. <laughs> So this, this definitely can happen. Um, and usually from what I've read, I was never confronted to this problem directly. And what I've seen in the literature is that this can happen when you're dealing with uh, very 
small numbers or very large numbers because this is so because the, the way computers deal with um, with real numbers they have a, a a representation that is not really exact and so what can happen is that if you're dealing for example with these very small numbers in physics or these very large numbers or very very low numbers also in finance um, you can get some uh, some problems in terms of precision and different hardware handle that differently from what i read so definitely that can be a problem i don't know exactly what could be the solution as long as you are able to at least recompile the whole project for different hardware you have at least a guarantee that you can run it now will the results be exactly the same that's 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 a bit tricky here i guess the only solution to make it extra sure is that you need some kind of compatibility layer you need for example now in the recent um, <clears throat> mac OS, uh, so mac computer apple computers they switch architectures uh, last year i think that was they have these m1 computers now and they actually have a, like a compatibility layer i think it's called rosetta to run software for older architectures um, and i guess that is the only way out so you would need to run your pipeline inside uh, such a compatibility layer and i believe that docker now on uh, mac os uh, or, or rather on m1 computers uh, has this um, compatibility layer that you can enable in the options to make sure that actually the code you're running behaves the same way but yeah i guess compatibility layer is the only only way out or you should but that is not always feasible but you should try to target hardware that is that is open but that's not really very common nowadays there is i think risk five uh, cpus that are one day maybe coming out but and this is like an open architecture but yeah i don't see that really hitting the mainstream very soon right thanks uh yes so our studio <clears throat> So we have here a script uh, to save the data. I won't go through everything because it takes a bit of time, but I think you recognize roughly where this is going. I, I start by downloading some data, and then I have a little function here that I that allows me to clean the tables for each sheet, and I loop over these sheets, and then I, I could transform some data. I, I translate the column names from French to English, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I check the spelling uh, because uh, we have three official languages in Luxembourg. We have French, German, and Luxembourgish. So sometimes the names are written in German, sometimes they're written in, in, in French, etc. So I try to, to you know, have everything uh, coherent, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it's it's like standard standard stuff. Um, you know, it's really yeah. You see, I I I, I, I try to clean everything. The, the the commune names, standard things that we all do on a daily basis. And then at the end, I save my data uh, into two CSV files, OK? A commune level CSV file. So commune, again, is the lowest administrative um, uh, division of Luxembourg, and then a country level, OK? And then I do my analysis. My analysis, again, uh, very standard stuff. I start by loading some packages. Uh, I load my data that I saved just before. I compute some indices. So this is a Las Perry index for prices. Uh, if you don't know what that is, doesn't really matter. I just just build some. Uh, I just add some columns. That's it. Uh, and then I, I I have my communes that I want to uh, print uh, that I want to plot. So I want to do some plots, some nice plotting. And I do a plot for for the commune of Luxembourg. So <laughs> Luxembourg is funny because you have the country Luxembourg, then you have the commune of Luxembourg, and you have the city of Luxembourg. So there's like three <laughs> three levels. But the commune and the city is the is actually the same thing. Um, then we have another called Esh sur Z, then we have Mama, et cetera, et cetera. So for each of these communes, I do my plot. Okay, so that's really standard stuff. Um, and now we're going to think about, you know, what is maybe wrong with these scripts, okay? Um, well, first of all, not much. Let me just say that. They're, I mean, they do the job. If I have to do a report and I need to have these plots, writing this is perfectly fine. I just need to be aware that there are these shortcomings that I'm going to list here, and I have to either accept them or deal with them. So the first problem is that these scripts, are, so the whole workflow, let's say, is, is a script-based workflow, OK? Um, so I have to run one script, and then I have to run the other. Uh, if I had 10 scripts, I, I need somehow to know or, and have and um, yeah, know about the order I need to, to run them. 
Uh, it's just a long series of calls. So I do this, then I do that, then I do this, then I do that, right? So there are no functions that I can reuse. I didn't write any function. Well, not quite. I did write one function. I did write, let me just show you again. I did write this function here to, to clean basically uh, the data. Um, but, but, it's, uh, but that's it. Like the rest is just a series of calls. Uh, it's difficult to reuse uh, because I, there are no functions that I can just copy and paste somewhere else and reuse them, okay? It's difficult to test. Functions are very easy to test. I won't talk about it today, but um, again, uh, in the book, I explained this in, in great detail. It's very easy to test. Uh, and uh, a script-based workflow is very difficult to parallelize. Basically, it's impossible to parallelize uh, unless you completely rewrite uh, how it works. Uh, then there's a lot of repetition as well. And let me show you again. When I do my plotting down here, I do one plot for MAMA. I do one plot for Schengen. By the way, Schengen is the, this is the town that gave the name to the Schengen area. Now you know, it's in Luxembourg. And uh, there's this uh, plot here. And it's always the same code. You see, it's always the same code. I just change here the, the communes that I want to plot. So there are better ways to, uh, to do that, OK? Um, and yeah, also something else, well, this depends. It's not necessarily a huge problem. But usually, we don't really want a script at the end. What we want at the end is some kind of report, some kind of document, or a paper, or a thesis, whatever. So we, don't ju we just don't want a script. We want actually something that humans can then read, right? Um, and the last problem is that there is no record of packages, no R versions used. Uh, as you see here, when I do my calls um, up there, I just have, I, I, I load my packages, but I, I didn't write anywhere which versions I was going to use and also which version of R I was going to use, okay? So to make our, our project reproducible, we actually need to answer the following questions that come here. First of all, how easy would it be for someone else to rerun the, the analysis? Here, it seems to be fairly simple, but you know, if it's something with a bit more scripts, you know, five, six, 10 scripts, we actually even need to write documentation because like this, nobody can rerun it. Um, how easy would it be to update the project? In this case, also seems to be fairly okay, you know? How easy would it be to reuse code for another project? Well, here, not really. You cannot really reuse anything because there, there's no function that you can just copy and paste. And what guarantee do we have that the output is stable through time? So if I rerun this script in six months, one year, two years, what guarantee do I have that I will get the same result? Well, here, in this case, there is none, basically. Uh, so answering these four questions, even if some of them are not 100% rel relevant for our project, but forcing us to answer these questions will actually yield a reproducible project. Um, maybe before talking about the easiest and cheapest thing you should do, I should look at the questions if there are some. I don't know. Uh, probably a question for the end, so maybe let's keep it at the end then. <laughs> um, OK, so fine, I don't see anything. Great, OK, so let's continue. So the cheapest thing you should do, in the easiest, and it already covers a lot of bases, is to use RENV. And you will see it's uh, very nice and easy to use. Um, with RENV, you can create a so-called RENV log file in two easy steps. First of all, you open an R, in an R session in the folder that contains the scripts. And then you run rnv in it. Let's do it. Let's see how it works. So I am in my folder here. Uh, I just need to set the working directory. So now I'm in the right folder, right? So if I if I list my files, I see that these are the files that I have. So let's run rnv in it. So I'm asking, do you want to proceed? Blah, blah, blah. Yes, I want to proceed, of course. So something happens. Um, what happens is that Rn, first of all, looks at the dependencies that are in my, uh, in my scripts that I call and lists all of them, okay, and says, well, well, you have here these packages that you need to save and there's these other packages. And these are all the packages 
that I use plus their dependencies. For example, I only use th these four, but these are all the dependencies that get saved along with it. So now uh, it's, you know, it's done. Okay, so if I look now at my folder, I have now several files, uh, additional files. So if I look at the rn block file now, the rn block file is a JSON file. It's a list, basically. The first element tells me, well, which version of R did I use to create this file? And which version of R did I use for my project, basically? And then I have a list of packages. And I have a list with the package name, with the versions, and where they come from. So this one comes from CRAN, uh, but you can have packages from GitHub as well. So if you install a package from GitHub, R and will know how to deal with that and will reinstall it as well as, we saw, as I will show you later on. The other thing that appeared is this rn folder, very important because this rn folder, if you look into it, you have a library here. And this library is actually the library of packages for this project. So you can have a project specific libraries and these project specific libraries don't clash with each other. So you can have one project with very uh, recent versions of R and another project with very old versions of R, for example, or R packages, should I say. So this is quite nice. And this file uh, is very useful, this R and vlog file, because you can do several things with it. First of all, you can share it alongside your paper or your analysis and the data, even if you don't do anything else with it ever, but you can share it. This gives a blueprint for people, first of all, to be able to restore the packages if they want to rerun your code, and I will show you how it works. And second of it, you can use that with Docker as well to kind of regenerate the whole the whole environment, as we will see uh, at the end of the of the presentation. So I have generated this. Great. I can now work uh, with. Uh, I can continue working. I could install packages, add packages, and regenerate this file. Okay. If I install a package, then I could regenerate the file the, the file by calling rn snapshot, this would rewrite the file, okay? Or if I remove, for example, if I remove a dependency and I snapshot, then this dependency will get removed. So I can do that. Uh, or I can just say, well, I'm done with my project. I published my paper, I published my report. Now I will generate this log file and I will share this log file with the data and with, uh, with the source code of my project, okay? That's really super simple because it's literally just running rn in it, that's it and you get this file. Um, let's me go back to the presentation. Just one quick question, which yes. is uh, specific to our end. So did yes. our end int look at all the R scripts in the current, current folder or just the script currently open in use? So it, um, it looks at everything inside the folder. So if you have 10 scripts that call 30 packages, it will look at everything, even if you, so now I have opened one here for illustration, but I could close them could close the scripts and I could regenerate that. It just looks at everything. If I add here yeah, a new script with uh, new calls, it will also look at them. And even uh, Arend goes even further. Arend does not just look at this, right? At this, but if I do something like this in my script, uh, like janitor, uh, clean names, uh, empty cars, for example, Arend would also look at that. Okay, I actually, that's why I don't know if I have janitor now installed, but we will see. When you try things live, it never works. So yeah, you see it's already up to date. So it's not working probably because I need to install it first and then I can snapshot and it, it will work. But I don't know if it's going to work because this is running inside the Docker container and it's immutable. So oh, actually it worked, so. Okay, just what one problem? question that was, I think already answered in the chat, but uh, so our end, will it also look at code in uh, our markdown? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So it will look at everything. It will look at everything. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yes, yes. So I, it's telling me it's already up to date. Maybe I have Janitor already somewhere. I don't know, uh, because I probably, I might have used it somewhere here. Yeah, as you see, I, I also use it here like this. So maybe I have Janitor, but it doesn't matter for now. Anyway, the R and block file. Uh, so as I explained, you it lists a version of R and it lists packages that are going to get used. So we can also use a R and vlog file to restore a project, okay? So it's not just a record, it also helps restoring projects. So if I go to scripts R and restore, 
And by the way, as I told you, this is running inside a Docker container and you can actually download and run this Docker container with all the code, with all the examples. I will uh, show you that at the end. If I go into rn restore, I have here an rn log file and actually let me restart a fresh se session. And let me go here. So you always need to restart the sessions because if you don't, there might be problems. Uh, if you try to, to restore uh, an, a log file, etc. So now I'm in a fresh session. Let me close everything. So I got this error message, but that's not a problem. It's just because uh, it's looking at this R profile that is here. And this R profile contains RNF activate to actually activate the environment. But there is no environment here to activate yet. So let's let's have one to activate. Let me um, let me set the working directory. Here we are. So list files. Am I in the right? Yes. Rn block. Great. Let me run rn restore. Would you like to activate it? Yes. Would you like to proceed? Yes. So this is going to take some time. Uh, but it, what is going to happen is that rn is going to inst to download and install the packages just for this project. Now I must say it's sometimes not going to work. Sometimes rnv is not able to restore old packages. And um, uh, here you see, it is quite interesting. I need to restore an old version of mass and you see it's getting downloaded from the archive. So it, it really is downloading old packages. Now, the reason it's not always going to work is because um, your operating system has evolved. So maybe some dependencies that these packages need are not available anymore, okay? So you, you can't install them uh, like this. So this is this can happen. Um, and the older your log file, the likely it is to happen. But still, this is going to be useful as we, saw, as we will see with Docker later on. So let me go back to the, uh, I'll, I'll just let the, the, the restore run. So if just you- Just a quick you know, question while it's uh, running. Yes. Um, yes. So is there any particular reason uh, you aren't using RN version 1.00? Yes, the particular reason is that uh, this presentation, I prepared it like two weeks ago already. And uh, RN 1.0 was released, I think on Monday or Friday, something like that. So it's <laughs> just for this reason. Uh, actually, I was going to say, you should definitely take a look at RN 1.00 because there are a lot of very nice features that were added. So definitely take a look at that. Yeah, but no, uh, the, the reason is that I'm lazy. That's it, <laughs> I didn't want to update the whole thing. Um, but uh, but you're right. There is this new version that that comes with with very nice uh, features, nice, nice new features. But this basic basic um, workflow, let's say, it stays the same. Um, yeah. So it's going to take some time. Um, anyway, there are some shortcomings. Okay, it's not a miracle solution. First of all, it records but does not restore the version of R. Okay, so it only restores, and actually we can take a look at it. It only restores packages. And I believe there should even be a little warning here. Uh, yes, you see, when I restored this log file, it RNV is telling me, well, you are using R version 4.3.1, but this particular log file was generated with R 4.1.0. So basically be careful because maybe it's not going to work or maybe if it works, maybe your, your result will not be the same because the R version is different. So you do get this this uh, this message, right? So um, that's the first problem or shortcoming, let's say. Um, as I explained, installation of very old packages can can fail, uh, and it's and it's very funny because I I teach, so I work full time at the ministry, but I also teach just one course on this, basically on reproducible pipelines at the university here in Luxembourg. And we, I have a, a class with like 15, you know, 16 students, something like that. And they, there's a mix of computers and operating systems. Some are on Windows, some are on, on Ubuntu, some are on Mac OS. And whenever I have them try to restore a project, it really seems to fail at random. It's not like it always works on, on Windows or it always works on Mac or always works on Ubuntu or always fails on Windows. Just like randomly, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So, you know, it really depends on your machine. However, even though there's these shortcomings, RN, uh, you know, generating this log file is basically free. Well, as I showed you, it's very simple. And it provides a nice blueprint for what's coming, uh, which is dockerizing our pipeline. 
Um, and yeah, as I said, you have a project specific library, so it's not like it's interfering with anything else that uh, you are doing. So that's pretty nice. So where are we on the continuum? Uh, we have a record of packages and our version. We have a way to restore packages, but it doesn't always work. But we don't have a pipeline yet. We are still in this script-based workflow world, let's say. So now I'm going to talk about target. Just before you move on, yes. maybe just one more question on our end, um, yes. which is, can you also use rig with RN, uh, which will take care of the lo to yes. load the appropriate R version? Yes, you can do that. And I uh, mentioned that in the, the longer version of this, uh, of this uh, I don't mention it today because we are going to deal with the R version with Docker. But yeah, you could. So Rig is a tool uh, that you can install on your computer that uh, makes it very easy to install different versions of R. Uh, and you could indeed uh, install the version you need, then use RNV to restore your packages. And then basically you, you can continue working. So this definitely works. And it's a very nice solution if you cannot install Docker, for example. Uh, or if you don't want to install Docker. So that's definitely one thing you could do. The issue is that then you have to keep track of which projects use which version of R uh, and which you know pipeline goes with which version, et cetera, et cetera. So it can get tricky uh, if you have many projects, but that's definitely something you can use. So um, if you want to look for rig, look at um, Google, uh, the R installation manager, and you will find a, a GitHub repository with the tool. Um, yeah, the cloud platform indeed. So um, if you are working, for example, on uh, GitHub Actions, so if you are using GitHub Actions to run your pipelines, I won't talk about it today, uh, but if you are doing that indeed, like there is a cache, for example, and so installation goes very quickly. Um, so that's that's pretty nice. And there's probably other, other solutions like this that, that also cache the installation process. So that's that's very nice indeed. Uh, let me just check on my packages. Well, the, you know, it's still going, uh, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't work or if it takes too long, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, stop it. It doesn't matter for what's coming now. So targets. Uh, so I, I will show you the final result of the pipeline. So basically my scripts transform as a pipeline immediately because we don't have that much time. I cannot walk you through the whole process, but I think I think uh, you, you will understand. Um, how, oh, you see, there it is. So the mass package could not be installed probably because i'm missing some uh, c++ library or something like that and uh, and yeah it's not even that old so it's it wasn't even th that old of a version so you see uh, even on something quite recent it doesn't doesn't always work but no fear we will uh, we will deal with that let me just show you uh, let's talk about pipelines now so I will go here, I will restart a fresh session. That's important to avoid any problems. Let me do it again. There we are. So uh, we are in this pipeline. So um, RN restore loaded, let me just check. Ah, yeah, I think it's because I'm not in the right working directory. There we are. Let me just see, it's fine. Yeah. So I'm in the right working directory. Let me just, you know, restart it again to make extra sure there we go okay so now i am i will show you how my two scripts look as a pipeline and for this we're going to use the targets package targets is an extremely extremely useful package i highly recommend anyone to use it because it's it's really an amazing package and i hope that my short presentation here will convince you to use it because i think it's really amazing so as you see, um, I have this uh, structure. I have a, a file called underscore targets.r, another one called anal analyze data.rmd. So this is a markdown script, some functions, a folder with functions, and a log file. Okay, so let's start with my targets.r. So targets.r is the script that defines the pipeline. Basically, the pipeline is a series of computations, okay? And let me just skip the first rows and then I'll go back to it. The pipeline itself is this list of these things. These things are target objects and they all start with, they're all defined using the star target function. So tar target takes two, at least two arguments. The first one is a name, okay? And then there's this function. So this function 
does something with its input, and then the output that gets produced gets saved into this thing, okay? And as you see, this raw data, okay, this is basically the output of this function here, get raw data. And get raw data is defined up, up here. I will show you afterwards. It's defined into this folder, there's a get raw data script, okay? Then once I have this raw data, I give it as the input of the next function called clean raw data. And this clean raw data produces the flat data uh, that is here. And this flat data, as you can see, is used as an input in these functions and so on and so forth. So essentially what you do with the targets pipeline is that you define your pipeline as a list and this list as for elements target objects and these target objects are the result of one function doing one thing, okay? At the end, I have a special uh, target. It's the, that, I, that I can produce using the tar render function. And tar render, as the name says, is to render a markdown file, okay? It's to compile if you want a markdown file. So in my case, I compile this RMD file and you don't see it here, but this object up here, which is a list of communes that I want to analyze, this list of communes is called into this RMD file. So target knows that this is you know, the output of the pipeline. So let me just, before showing you um, how it looks graphically, let me just go up once more and discuss the beginning. So I load the target package and I load the Tarsha types package. So why? Because, well, targets is the package that contains these tar target functions. Okay, so I need that, obviously. And Tarsha types, this is, it could have been called like targets extra, for example. Uh, this is just a library that contains, or a package that contains more of these target objects. In this case here, uh, it's the star render function. So the star render function comes in, in the Tarsha types. So there's more things like that in this Tarsha type. So this is just a special object. Um, then I, def I load my packages like this and not as usual. You can do it as usual, but there is a very good reason to do it like this. And I will come back to this later. So for now, just accept <laughs> that's, that's how you load packages in a target pipeline. Okay, these are the packages that I actually need for my pipeline. So dplyr, ggplot for plotting, janitor to clean the uh, column names, etc., etc. And then I just load two scripts and if I look at the scripts, these basically contain the functions. So if I, if I look at get raw data, you see that I have here these functions. And these functions, okay, if we go back to the very beginning, if we go back to save data.r, it's basically the code that I have in save data.r. But now I rewrote that as functions, okay? I rewrote this code as functions. So this function, you know, cleans the raw data. Then there's this, this function gets the communes, that gets a list of communes from Wikipedia. Um, this function gets the former communes because there are communes that don't exist anymore that have merged, etc. Then this function, you know, it gets the raw data, the XLS file itself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's exactly the same code, but now it's as functions. And as you see, I have a series of, of weird-looking comments. These are comments. So these are so-called Roxygen comments that you can write uh, like this uh, because. I actually wrote this script in a way that I can package it. So here I don't talk about packages, so that's why I'm showing it to you like this. But in the book, actually, we go one step further and I package this whole thing. And this is how you document functions in a package. But this is not really important today. What is important is to realize that basically this is the code from this save data.r uh, script. And then I have another function, get lasperse, and this is just to compute this lasperse index, okay? And again, it's the same thing. And then I have the make plot function. So this is to create my plots. So again, if we go into the analysis, um, recent files, analysis.r, you see at the end, I have, I repeated like five times, you know, this code to plot. Now I have it as a function down here. And so I just can simply loop Right? I can simply loop over the communes and I can generate my plots. I don't need to rewrite this five times. And this is what happens if we look at the RMD file, the output of our pipeline. Well, you see that I, I, load, my, I load my communes, I load my data, I load my commune, 
And then I do this complicated stuff. I won't comment it too much, but basically I, I plot my five communes, okay? So just a couple of quick questions yes. uh, on those points. Um, so yes. the first one is uh, in the target list, do we have yes. only functions? Yes, so targets is very strict in the, each target has to be a function. So it has to be the output of a function and a function. And even it has to be ideally a pure function. So I, I, I said I, I, was, I wasn't going to talk about functional programming, but a pure function is, a fu is it's like a mathematical function. It's a function that has an input and an output. That's it, it doesn't do anything else. Uh, an impure function would be a function that does something and then like prints a message. That's an impure function. So it has to be pure functions. And yeah, it has to be functions, yes. Okay, uh, next one is, is tar target comparable to DAGs? Yes, so we will we will look at the uh, the representation. So I don't know if it's exactly a DAG, um, a directed acyclically graph, uh, but but we will look at a, at the network representation of the pipeline in in two minutes. Yes, so you'll tell me if that's a, a DAG in the in the in the sense that you meant. Okay, cool. Uh, and last one: Do you source those functions in the RMD file, or doing that in targets is enough? Uh, so the functions, I source them in the pipeline, okay, not in the RMD. So as you can see, as you can see um, uh, here, I just load, so I will show you. So tar loads, actually loads the output, loads the, the objects, but I will show that later. Uh, but but the, um, so the, the sourcing is done in the targets.r script. And I saw another function, that, and it's a, another question, sorry, uh, about uh, scraping from, from Wikipedia. Uh, that is a very good point. Uh, I scrape from Wikipedia uh, in this uh, script down here. And um, yeah, here, here it is, where it is, uh, where is it? At some point I scrape some lists from Wikipedia. And indeed this list, there it is, this list can evolve. So, if, and if they evolve, if the URL disappears, it can be a problem. So indeed, a better way for reproducibility would be actually to save the underlying HTML, like save it somewhere on your hard drive with the project, basically, and use that as the input. Definitely, yeah. Uh, another way that I tried to to work around that was to archive the page using archive.is, but um, I wasn't able then to scrape it. So, but definitely, yeah, you're right. This is actually not very good practice. You should save the the HTML file somewhere and then scrape from the saved HTML file. Definitely. Uh, and the code you're just showing, is it available on GitHub? Uh, yeah, so everything is available on GitHub. So um, if you actually, if you go into, well, I think I will have a link in the slides to, but I, I think I you think can I just send it to me later and I will just yeah, send it. But, but uh, everything is available, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, okay, so let me go back. So. Let's first of all take a look at the pipeline. So let me let me load targets, and let me run um, tar biz network. So this will show me a visual representation of the pipeline. And as you can see, do you still see my screen? Maybe, yeah. yeah. Maybe I should just yeah. Maybe I should keep it on one window. So we see that <clears throat> we have these inputs. Okay. And then they get computed. So for example, flat data is the output of the raw data plus the function clean raw data. And then flat data, from flat data, we get commune level data and commune level data is actually the output of make commune level data, et cetera. So you can even move the things over here and then you get, you know, so and so it gets, you know, to the output. And as you can see, we have two little uh, things down here and these little things, they are completely independent from the rest of the pipeline, which means that using targets, it's targets figures out what are the independent parts of your pipeline and knows how to run them in parallel. So you can ask targets to run your pipeline in parallel and targets will figure out what is independent and what can run safely in parallel. And so this is why you need to load your packages like this because what, what targets will do is that it will create new R sessions, one per core, per CPU core that you have, and will send this list that is here that I highlighted, will send this list to each session. And if you call the, uh, the libraries like this, like usual, 
our, uh, so targets will not know which packages should be loaded in these new sessions. That's why we do it like this, okay? It's to run it in parallel. Uh, as you see there, all every target is blue. So basically uh, it's outdated. So let's build the pipeline using tarmake. So tarmake will run the pipeline. And here you see it downloads the data that I archived on my GitHub. So this one will never change now. <laughs> so actually that's the, that's the, uh, the URL to the, to, to the book actually. So um, you, the source code of the book is also available. So it's not just the book that is available, even the source code is available. And so you see every target gets built, okay? It takes a little bit of time, but um, you know that's fine. We get some warnings, that's okay. It's because I convert these uh, columns that are text in the Excel file in, into numeric, okay? And whenever they are empty, uh, so this the empty string gets converted to an NA. So that's why we say, well, there's NAs, NAs introduced by coercion, that's fine. Let's just take a look at the network again. Okay, and bam, now it's green because everything is up to date. Great, so that's really nice. But what's, what's really, in my view, amazing, it's what I'm going to show you now. And you can tell me if you find this amazing or not, but I, I really love targets because of this. Let's say that I don't like the city of Eschral Z and actually I don't like this city. So let's remove it. Let's save my targets and let's look at my pipeline. If I look now at my pipeline, oh, what's happening? Well, what's happening is that targets recognize that my list of communes is outdated now. And so because my list of communes is outdated, my report is also outdated, okay? But everything else is green, okay? Everything else is green. So what's going to happen is what I find amazing is now that I will rebuild my pipeline, targets will skip every target that is up to date Okay, as you see here, skip, 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 and only rebuilds the communes and the report. Okay, and this is great because as you can imagine, if you have a pipeline that takes several hours to run, and that is huge, if you have hundreds and hundreds of targets, if you change something somewhere, you don't need to rerun the whole thing. Targets will figure out for you what needs to be rerun, okay? And now we can look at the report, which is here. So I compiled into an HTML. Um, and if I open it in my web browser, now I have this nice report here and, you know, I can look at my plots and I am happy now because there is no plot about H2RZ. But let's say that I regret my actions and I want H2RZ to be back. I will save it again. I will rerun my pipeline again. So again, everything will get skipped, but the communes and the reports. And if I look at my report, if I refresh, now my commune is there. HTRLZ is there. So this is really amazing because, and it's a huge improvement over a script-based workflow. Because if you have a script-based workflow, you have to, what the targets just did for you automatically, you have to do it yourself, basically. You have to think about, okay, shall I rerun this script and that script? Uh, wait, no, this one or this one? So it's a mess. So this is really, really, really useful. Finally, I just want to show you that we computed, for example, flat data. You can use star read flat data. This will read the data and will show you the data uh, as it is. Uh, but if you do tar read, it just shows you. Okay, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't load it to the, your environment. If you do tar load flat data, then you actually get it in your environment. And if you look at my RMD, this is what I do to load the data. I use tar load, tar load, tar load communes, etc. So this is what I do. Okay. Uh, let me just see if I didn't forget. So what's the target, the pipeline? Oh, yes, there is a very last thing. This I talked about, blah, blah, blah. Our analysis is a pipeline. So I discussed all of this. So targets, oh yeah, targets provide a clear view of what's happening as well beyond documentation. So basically, if someone else wants to rerun the pipeline, well, just by looking at the targets file, they can get a good grasp, okay, because it's the sequential calls that you have here with very clear names. Of course, you have to be disciplined and use clear names for your functions. You can add comments. So for example, here I explain what communes are. So you can add more context, but just that provides really a very nice view of what the project, how you should run the project actually. So uh, that's, that's pretty nice. 
uh, functions can now be easily reused and packaged. So that's what I did in the book, actually. Uh, and the pipeline is pure. So it's a sequence, so it's a composition of pure functions, basically, which means that there is no external, no external input is needed or required to run the results. So uh, the pipeline compiles a document, which is often what we need, actually. We need a document, we, don't, we just don't want a script, okay? Uh, and the computations can be run in parallel as well. And finally, um, what else is missing? So, you know, so we have this pipeline, okay, that's running, but what is missing is RNV. So we are we didn't. So I run this pipeline on my normal R session, but I have an RNV log file here, right? So I can call RNV init. I will not do it now because it's going to take some time, but I can do RNV init, right? Actually, let's let's just I can I can then uh, cancel it. RNV init, and then once everything is done installing, I can rerun my pipeline with the correct packages versions. The only problem is that I don't have the right R version, but now I have a pipeline and I have the right packages. So I'm almost done and there's half an hour still, and that should be fine for what's coming, hopefully. I will just take a look at the questions maybe. Yeah, there were a couple of them. Maybe we just take two minutes to just go okay. through them. So one was about uh, the sort of no pure functions. Um, so what happens if we use them and does it make our project less reproducible? So what happens, uh, for example, <clears throat> if, if I, okay, uh, let's, you, you, you all know about the plot function. Okay, so plot, okay, plots something. So I just plot the empty cars data set. Uh, plot is not a pure function. W what plot does, it just changes pi pixels on your screen. If I do, a, if I try to save my plot into A, right? If I look at A, so if I if I remove now my, my plots, if I look at A, A is null, okay? So there is no object that is return, returned by a uh, plot. So if I use plot as a here somewhere, instead of, you know, instead if I, if I come here and I say, you know what? Uh, I want uh, my tar targets and I want uh, like my plot, and I want it to plot empty cars, you know, or plots, I don't know, flat, uh, flat data, maybe it's even better because we stay, you know, I, I now, I, I run my, my thing, okay. Uh, wait, oh yeah, there's a, a comma missing. So I run my thing, it's fine. So what's going to happen? So targets is going to run. Now I do, you know, car load uh, my plot. I look at my plot and it's not. So the problem is that these functions, they don't return an object or they don't necessarily return an object. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Target really needs an object to be able to pass that object to, the, to further functions down the pipeline so that they know what to do with them. So uh, that's why I use ggplot in this pipeline and also because I prefer ggplot, but ggplot actually returns an object. So you can save, you can say, well, B, you know, is uh, is a ggplot of uh, you know of whatever. I don't need don't even need to to add something. But now, if I if I type b, I actually see a canvas, and if I if I do like uh, structure of b, I see that there is stuff in there. It's a list basically. A ggplot is a list basically, uh, as you see, a list of, of stuff. Um, so that's why ggplot functions are pure. Uh, well, they're impure because they also show things, you know, uh, if I type B again, something happens, but at least I have an object and I can pass that down to my pipeline. I hope that was clear. Yeah, uh, otherwise I think everyone's pretty much sold. There was just one question about Python. So if there's something similar in Python. Um, to targets, there's the you mentioning, mean. yeah, there's the mentioning of snake make. Yeah, so um, so there, there are other other such uh, build automation tools. So there's SnakeMake. There, I used WAF uh, like 10 years ago uh, to, to do these kind of things. There's Make, also a Unix utility. The difference between these tools and targets is that targets really focuses on this notion of uh, pure functions. So, um, and it comes with certain benefits. Now, of course, uh, if you are using Python and uh, you know you, you can use SnakeMake and, and it will work fine, that, that's not an issue. But um, targets goes a bit beyond the, that because it uses this concept of pure functions and it provides a certain 
um, because it doesn't rely on anything external, your pipeline stays pure, you can be pretty safe that the results that you will get will not be influenced by anything else. So for example, Snakemake typically could, uh, like the, you remember the example I talked about the ordering of uh, data sets in that chemistry paper. Well, Snakemake, you know, you could use Snakemake and, and, and try to use the order of files. You could not do that with targets because this is something outside of the pipeline. So in pi targets would force you to deal with this in a pure manner. And so you, you would be more safe, let's say. Mm. I also have a question, and this is from someone yes. who has never used targets. But yes. what about if you're actually using different softwares and you generate different outputs from different softwares? Is yes. it possible to combine it in targets or it's you, you always have to stay in the R environment? So uh, the only way that you could achieve that is the, that you, you would need to call these other softwares from R. Okay, so you would need mm -hmm. to, so for example, if you're using Stata, I think there is, I, I'm not sure, but I think there is like an R to Stata package or something like that, or Stata to R, whatever, that allows you like to call Stata from R. And then of course, uh, what you could also do, uh, there is uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if a lot of people are aware, but there's this system two command. And system two actually like runs uh, commands from your operating system. So if you know how to run, let's say, Stata or Python or whatever with the command line, you could, you could, you know, write a function in R that wraps like, uh, like system, you know, system two and then Python and then, you know, your script, your, uh, you know, my, my script uh, okay. dot pi, whatever. And this will run actually Python and, you know, so that could be a way of doing it. Sí, yo, yo nada más agregué esa sección ahí porque si no era repetir. So, sorry? Uh, there was... Oh, I think it was just... Uh... Oh, okay. Um, okay, where are we in the comments? But then, yeah, I see uh, Joey Heffer mentions that there are other tools that are language agnostic, like SnakeMake, again, and WAF as well. So you could use that, like if you, if you really need to, to mix languages. Yeah, you could use something like WAF or, or SnakeMake, or uh, there's also Flow, I think, or I think it's Flow, something like that. Yeah, you could definitely do that as well. Yeah. And what do you think of using our projects in our studio for replication? Because it just copies everything? Well, our, our projects are, are useful in, the, in so far as um, it deals with the paths mostly, but it won't deal with, with like saving saving the uh, the library for example so if i if if we are collaborating for example and um actually you, i i i wouldn't even be able to open your uh, dot proj file okay because r r uh, has this um now let me show you so a project if you if you start a project what's going to happen is that r is going to generate this r proj file but this r proj file is only valid for you actually and, and if, if we are collaborating, for example, using Git, uh, where is this approach file? There it is, this file here, R, this R approach file, actually it should even be added to the Git in your, because I will not be able to reuse it. And, and this file, this is just like a JSON file, I think. Uh, now I cannot, I don't know if I can like open it. No, I, I can't, but if you open it in a text editor, it, it's just a JSON file that just specifies some, you know, some variables. Uh, but it won't help you with um, it won't help you with uh, like the reproducibility because it it won't save like packages and you will not be able to restore the library and things like that and also uh, the R version is still missing as well. Okay, great. Um, maybe we should move on just in the interest of time because we have yeah. a little bit more than twenty minutes. And yes, I can share the code and everything is uh, out there. And if there are if you don't find it just writes to me, but yeah, everything is okay. So ensuring long-term reproducibility using Docker. We have 22 minutes, I think I can make it, but let me just warn you, Docker is, has a high entry cost, unfortunately, but it's very useful. I will try to make this presentation as easy and gentle as possible. But remember the core problem is that we have something that works on my machine only. Well, it turns out that the solution is to actually ship the machine to solve this issue. And for this, we're going to use Docker. So what is Docker? Docker is a so-called containerization tool. So it's something that you can install on your computer. It works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, it allows you to build so-called Docker images. 
Okay, so a Docker image is uh, an environment, let's say, and out of this image, you can run containers. Okay, and a container is an instance of an image. Docker images contain all the software and code and potentially even data needed uh, for your project. Okay, you can add everything to it if you want. They are immutable, so you cannot be changed. You cannot change them. So you you could add things to it while it's running, but as soon as you stop the the container, then it's over. Okay, if you restart the container, everything you did disappears. Okay, and this is actually great, uh, as you will see uh, later on. Maybe it doesn't sound great, but it's actually great. They can be shared on and offline. So there's like uh, Docker registries where you can share your images, but you can also share them offline, like any other file on your computer. Um, and yeah, word of warning, it works best on Linux and Mac OS because on Windows, you need to enable, enable stuff in the BIOS and you need to enable a Windows subsystem for Linux. So it's a bit more complicated, but it also works. Okay, it also works. And again, yeah, this intro, I will try to be as gentle as possible, but it's not an easy topic. In any case, let's start with some Hello Docker. So Hello Docker, um, I made the easy, I think it's best if I show you um, down here. So uh, let me show you. So I have here my hello Docker. So I have this Docker file. And basically a Docker file is, let's say, a description of my environment. So in this case, I will start from an Ubuntu basis. So Ubuntu is a Linux distribution that is like probably the most used Linux distribution and definitely the most used to build Docker images. And then I just run a command that just tells me hello from Docker. That's it. It's nothing really fancy. So I can build an image out of this Docker file. And then when I will run a container, I will get a message telling me hello from Docker. That's it. OK. So this is basically what I explained here. So a Docker file, you can see that as a recipe for an image. Uh, and then I can build my image using the command Docker build. And then I can run a container okay, uh, called hello container out of this image. And I will get my hello Docker. So RM is just an option to remove the container after running. So it's just uh, so I basically once it's done running, it gets really stopped and deleted. OK, so I can rerun new containers with the same name and name. It's just to name my container. You don't even need to name them, but then they get some random name and it's not really useful. So without Docker, if I run my pipeline, I have my pipeline and my source code and it's running in the operating system X with version with R version 4.2.2. And I get an output. If I run the same pipeline with the same code on another operating system with a future version of R, let's say R 4.1.3, as you can see, the output is slightly different. It's not super different. It's still a star. But instead of having like, uh, seven, uh, like seven peaks, it has like eight now. So it's slightly different. And that's annoying. That's the problem. Basically, with Docker, what happens is that I have this capsule, if you want. And this capsule contains Ubuntu and a specific R version, and it's immutable. It will never change. And actually, what I do is that I run my pipeline inside of that capsule. And it doesn't matter on what operating system. It doesn't even matter if that operating system, if I have another version of R, the output will be computed inside that capsule and will come out inside uh, of, it will come out from that capsule, OK? Not from my operating system. So dockerizing a project. So I will show you the end result, um, but again, don't be afraid. It might look complicated, but I think it's really worth the effort if you need really reproducibility to, you know, in the long run. So there are two things that you need to be aware. There's the build time and there's the runtime. So at build time, I will install R or I will use an image that already ships with R. OK, and I will explain that in a few minutes. I will install packages using our R and log file that we generated. I will copy everything I need into the image. So the scripts, the data, whatever. Everything I need will go into the image. And then I will run my analysis using target star make. And all of this happens when I build the image, OK? And then when I run a container, I, am, I won't be running the analysis. When I run a container, all I will do, it's very simple. I will copy the outputs from the container to my computer. So everything that happens in Docker stays in Docker. But you can, when you run a container, create a shared folder between the container and your computer. And this shared folder will allow both, you know, both the container and the computer to communicate with each other. So that's what I do. I, I run the container with this shared folder and I just recuperate, I just get my outputs back. And I will do that live later, later on. 
So Doc Rising project part two. So the image I built, I can share that image and that image will contain already actually the results or I can just share the Docker file. But if I share just the Docker file, you know, my colleagues or whoever gets the Docker file will need to rebuild the image, okay? Um, the outputs will stay the same. So if you build this image today or tomorrow, it will stay the same. Well, strictly speaking, not that this is not quite true, but I, I need to simplify a bit for this presentation. But let's say that 99.9% .9 of the outputs will stay constant. And if we have a little bit of time at the end, I will explain where's this 0.1% coming from that is missing. And so build time versus runtime, really important to understand the distinction at build time, I build software, I pack, I add my packages, I add my dependencies, I add my scripts, I add my data, okay? Using run statements, I will show you in the Docker file. And I must ensure that the correct versions get installed. Even if I build my image today or in two years, I need to get the same versions. Well, we're in luck because RNV will ensure that my packages will be built the same way. And if I use an image that already ships with the required R version, well, it's already there. So I don't need to worry about that. And at runtime, the last command at the end that is that starts with CMD will get executed. And I will show you the end result of a, of a big Docker file uh, in, in, in one slide. Um, the Rocker project just before that. Um, as I said, it's possible to build new images on top of other images. And there's this Rocker project that provides many images already with R, with R Studio, with Shiny, et cetera, pre-installed. Um, and we are going to use Rocker images that are built specifically for reproducibility, this Rocker ver images. If you click here, you will see that you have everything uh, explained. They explain to you, and you can basically use these images as a base for your projects, okay? And these images come with a specific version of R and come already with some certain packages if you want. Okay, Docker Hub, um, finally. So when you when you write something like this from Ubuntu, uh, uh, an Ubuntu image is going to get downloaded into your computer, okay? And this image actually gets downloaded for, from uh, a website called Docker Hub. And you can also publish your images on Docker Hub. And actually the image that is running here with the slides and with this version of our studio, it's on Docker Hub and you can go there and see for, you know, you can build an image and share it on Docker Hub. See here, for example, and if I go, um, it's actually this image here. I ah, know this is not, this is something else that I did. This is my development environment. So this is my development environment that I work with. Um, you know, it comes with a certain version of Ubuntu, a certain version of R, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at my other, if you look at my other images, uh, there it is, wraps reprot. So this one, if you run this command here, okay, if you run that, in your terminal, if you have Docker installed, you, you will get exactly this environment that I'm showing you. You will, you, you will get exactly this, our studio with the slides, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can share images. There are other registries. Uh, uh, you don't need to use Docker Hub. There are others if you want, or you can even just, again, compress the image and you know send it in a USB stick, for example. That works as well. So finally, our project, let's look at the Docker file. So actually, I, I think I have the Docker file. Oh, no, I don't have, I don't remember. Do I have it here? Uh, yes, there it is. Yeah, so this is the, the Docker file. Um, it looks complicated, but I'll explain. So first of all, I start from the Rocker image, Rock uh, R version 4.3.4.4.3.0. So this is the image that comes with the right version of R. Then I install a lot of stuff and I will explain how this comes from in a minute. For now, just forget about it. I start with this. Then what I do is I install the, I install the RNF package and then I create some folders. I create a folder structure in the image. So this housing folder is going to exist in the image. Then I copy the log file into the right folder. I copy my functions folder again into the right folder. I copy my analyze data RND into the right folder again. You know, I, I'm just putting stuff in the right place for now. Then I copy my targets, fine. And then I run R, okay, RE. So this is how you run R inter non interactively, okay? So if you want to run a command 
in your from your terminal, this is how you do it. I go into the right folder, I start RNV and I restore my project. So this downloads all the packages, okay, and installs them. And because I am using because I am using the right version of R with the right version of the uh, lock file, you know, that was used to generate it, it works like always. I, I've I've never in my experience, I've never had problems. So you know, if you're really unlucky, maybe, but uh, I've never had problems. So, and then I uh, I you know I go into the right folder and I run my pipeline. Okay, so here I, I run it with CD, but you could just set the working directory like this. Doesn't really matter. And then you run the pipeline, and this happens all at build at build time when I build the image and then this command gets run when I run the container so when I run the container what happens is I move so MV is move um, I move the outputs from this folder into the shared folder and the shared folder is this folder that I talked about that uh, is shared between my computer and the doc image now these are all Linux commands so if you are if you use Linux you should be familiar with MKDR, you should be familiar with CD, with MV. If you don't use Linux well, tough luck, you will have to learn a little bit of, of Linux. But this is really like this this Docker file here, you know, that, that I can share with you. I mean, it's already online, actually, you can download it right now. Um, th th this is the, all the Docker files, 99% of the Docker files from projects like this will look like that. So uh, even if you don't really understand everything that is going on, you can just reuse it. Now comes all this stuff here, this weird stuff. So these are dependencies that you need to have installed for your packages to, uh, for your R packages to install. And how did I find them? Well, it turns out that there is um, actually my slides. I have a link to that. So this is what I explained. So in your opinion, what are the lines three to twenty-four doing? Click here. So basically, if I click here. I go into this website. So this is the pack. So this is the CRAN mirror from POSIT. Okay, and you can use that uh, as as your CRAN mirror uh, for daily work. But what is really nice is that they allow you to choose here yeah, your your Linux distribution or your macOS or Windows uh, computer. And if you click here, for example, for the PyCatch Tidier, they will tell you, well, you need to have this installed in your Ubuntu computer for this to work. OK, so if you don't have this installed, Tidier is not going to work. So basically what I did is that I painstakingly went to this website and gathered all the requirements and wrote them all down here. OK, so these are usually if you install all of this, you should be fine and it should work. Uh, and these are all the dependencies that you need to install. Now, there are other ways to deal with that, but this is, I believe, the most general way that doesn't rely on any external tool. There are certain external tools that would do this for you, but this is the most general way, let's say, uh, of doing it. Um, so let me just go back to the slide. So I told you it's going to be tough. But uh, So what do all the lines starting run do? So run, again, they run at build time. Copy just copies the file in the right place, and the last line basically runs the command. It basically runs the command, um, this last command at uh, runtime when I run a container. I, I will show you in a minute how it looks live. It's very you will see. It doesn't look like much, but it's 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 still nice because you get the output. Um, so yeah, this is what I, I showed you. So there's a Docker file, there's a lock file, there's a targets file. There's our script. There's everything we need to rerun it. Uh, ooh, uh, we don't see here, but uh, if I unzoom a bit, yeah, you can build the image using Docker builds. So this T just to give a name to the image. So it's tagging the image. So I, I, I name it housing image. And then the dot is to, to say I want to work with the Docker file in, in this folder right now. OK. And then basically, let me just reset. Uh, Basically, uh, I run my container. So first, I need to create my shared folder on the computer that I showed before. And then I can run the container with this command that looks terrible. I know there are other ways to run containers. But this is, again, I believe, the most general way without introducing other tools like Docker Compose. And then if you check the chair folder on your computer, the output will be there. Now, let, for the live demonstration, and you know how live demonstrations goes, go, but let me 
let me try. So do you still see my computer? Yep. OK. So uh, am I in the right? So do you see two terminals? Let me yep. just. Yeah, so this is the terminal on my computer now. It's not inside that, uh, that uh, our studio. So in my computer, there's this folder here. Let me just, yeah. It's exactly the same folder that I showed you. There's a Docker file, there are the functions, there's the targets, etc. So I will build the image. So because I already ran it, it's going to run very quickly because everything is cached. So it runs, it takes like zero seconds to run. Of course, if you build it, uh, if, you, if you really build it, it's going to take some time because it needs to install everything. So basically it just looked, so Docker build here, looked at my Docker file and build everything. Now, if I look at my shared folder, so this is my this is my uh, my terminal opened in my shared folder. If I look at my shared folder, it's empty. Okay, there is nothing in it. No files are in it. Okay, so there is no trick. Okay, so now let me let me run an an image using Docker Run. Okay, no, it's not the right image. Uh, so it's a housing housing container. Yeah, there there it is. So now I'm running. So Docker run, I'm running my housing container and I'm using, so this is the path to my shared folder on my computer. And this is the path to the shared folder in the Docker image. And I give it read and write writes. And this is the Docker image that I'm using to run my Docker container. I know it's very confusing it's, if it's the first time you see it, but if you take some time to reread the slides or better yet read the book, this will all make sense. What's important is that if I look now at my shared folder and if I do ls, there is my file. And this file was computed inside the Docker image and was saved into my computer. And now if I look at it, if I open it in my web browser, there it is. So this is the file that was generated inside my computer, uh, inside my Docker container. And to prove it to you, at the end of my RMD file, I added session info and session info shows you that it ran on Ubuntu 22.04, which is not the operating system on my computer. And it ran on version R 4.3.0, which is not the R version that is running on my computer. Actually, I don't even have R installed on my computer. I use my Dockerized environment to work with R. And these are all the packages that were used. And um, this was computed inside this Docker image. And if I rerun this in five years, it will be the same. So. We are almost done. I still have like two or three slides to show you. So is Docker Panacea? It's very use, It's very useful and it's very widely used, uh, not only for reproducibility purposes like I showed you, but for really, really a lot of applications. The entry cost is high though, uh, as you saw, it's not something that you can pick up in one afternoon. Uh, you need a little bit of time to, to, to learn about it, but there are many resources uh, like this one, for example, many resources to learn about Docker. Uh, however, it's a single point of failure. You know, if, if, if Docker gets bought or abandoned or whatever, you know, everything just disappears. Well, not quite because there are alternatives. For example, there is Podman, which is like a one-to-one -one alternative uh, of Docker and Podman is maintained by Red Hat. So um, it's, it's actually a tool that, um, that we are also using at, at my job. Well, that we plan to use. It's not entirely completely deployed yet, but it's like it's a serious tool. And then there are all the solutions uh, that work without containerization, without Docker, without tools like that. For example, Nix, and I'm exploring Nix. Uh, I actually even already, I've written a blog post about it. Nix is another very nice solution that works without any containerization. So, but it's also, the entry cost is also high. So in conclusion, what I, my advice to you is at least generate a, a log file that's very cheap to do, and it helps a lot. It's always possible to rebuild a Docker image in the future using that log file uh, by you or by someone else. So that's really useful. Uh, I highly recommend that you should consider targets because it's not only good for reproducibility, but it's really this amazing tool that simplifies a lot of, of, uh, of the workflow of your job. Uh, and you know, in long-term reproducibility, yes, if you really need long-term reproducibility, you need Docker or Podman or Nix or something like that. And some maintenance effort is required because when I said, well, you know, Docker, you have the input forever, not quite because the underlying Ubuntu image. So if I go back here, 
the, this Ubuntu latest, this changes through time. Okay, so if I want to not change, I need to fix it, for example, to 2204. So this is the version from April 22, uh, April 22, which is the last long term support version. But this version is only supported for five years. So in five years, I would need to port my pipeline to a more recent version of Ubuntu. So that's also uh, a bit problematic. And uh, yeah, that's that's the last slide. So I, I we have one minute left, but basically, if we have questions, just contact me, don't hesitate.